It's exciting to see such a good turnout. Thank you for, for coming. This is Elevate Your Approval Processes, Mastering Complex Workflows. Hopefully that's what you're here for. I'm Bob McDonald, Senior Drupal Architect at Kalamuna. Um, just a little bit about myself. I'm Ultra Bob on Drupal.org, originally from Idaho, but I moved to Japan right after I graduated university and I was there for about 23 years before I moved to Canada last year to join Kalamuna. I love making things that extends to web systems and I really care deeply about making sure that the systems I build are empathetic and consider the user first. So I hope to inject a little bit of that into this presentation today. Over the past several years of building approval systems in Drupal, I've gotten fairly good at it. So that's what I'd like to talk about today. And I built several while I was working at the Institute for Global Environmental Strategies in Japan, um, which is where a lot of the examples we'll talk about today come from. And Xiaojun here is, was my, is my successor in that role, so I'll let him introduce himself. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Xiaojun Deng. Um, um, I'm a senior web developer at the Institute for Global Change, uh, Global Environmental Strategies, IGES, based in Japan. I took over Bob's role um, as a developer last July, and he has since been my Drupal mentor, and he's helping me navigate my Drupal journey and flattening my learning curve along the way. Uh, I'm uh, currently maintaining the uh, approval systems internally and also um, building similar applications uh, for other workflows. I'm a linguist by training, and, uh, uh, but I like to identify more as an engineer and a maker. So I have worked with uh, Laravel and React before joining IGES, and I'm passionate about both user and uh, developer experience. Um, this is my first Drupal talk, and I appreciate your feedback, and I really thank you. If uh, I get uh, stumble on any slides, please be gentle. Thank you. So what are we talking about today? I want to start by just making sure that everyone's on the same page, so I'll, I'll spend a few minutes talking about workflows in core and what that looks like, and then we'll go through some examples of different systems that we've built over the past several years and what lessons we've learned through those experiences. Then I'll talk about what you should be thinking about when you're planning a system like this. I don't know what that was. Um, we'll, we'll go through some useful tools for building systems like this take a look at some code samples and, and get on to Q&A. So let's talk about workflows in core. So workflows in core consists of two modules. Um, the first is workflows, and that sets the framework, builds the framework for workflows, sets up states, transitions, default states. And it also introduces a workflow type plugin manager. And it's that workflow type plugin that allows workflows to do something in Drupal core. Without that plugin, it doesn't do anything. There are several workflow type plugins in the contrib space, but the one that comes with core is called content moderation. And so that's the one we'll be talking about today. And content moderation links your workflow with, a, with revisionable content entities, and it controls whether they're public or not. Um, and basically, out of the box, content moderation is intended for editorial type workflows. And so when I show you an example on the next couple slides, we'll be looking at an editorial type workflow. And then in the examples later on, we'll look at some more advanced um, approval systems. So let's take a look at uh, an example workflow. So you can see here we've got five states. And states are the different stages that your content, can t your request can take as you move through the approval system. Um, here we've got five of them, draft, awaiting editorial review, pending publication, published, and archived. And you can see that each of those states have two settings on them. Whether a revision saved into that state um, is considered published or not, and whether that revision becomes the default or not. And speaking about saving a revision into a different state, that's where transitions come in. Transitions are the different pathways from state to state in an approval system. So let's enable a few of those so we can have a look at them. You see that we've got three of them here, and you've probably noticed that they're all three different colors. Um, that's to explain the first of four things that I want to make sure everyone knows about transitions, um, and that is that each transition comes with a permission. So you can assign 
permissions to use each transition to users of a specific role. And so here in our example, we've got submit to editor, which can be used by authors. Um, we've got the publish transition that could be used by editors. And then we have this keep an editorial approval transition that can be used by both. So let's follow some content through the system. So an author comes along, creates some content, and uses transition A to submit it to the editor. And then the author and the editor might spend some time uh, editing it, polishing it, getting ready for publication. And they'll use transition B to keep saving it into awaiting editorial review, which leads me to the second thing I want to make sure that we talk about with transitions is that you need a transition for every pathway from state to state in your system. And that includes from and to the same state. So if we didn't have transition B here, um, given the transitions that we do have, once you submitted it to the editor and you made a change, your only option would be then be to publish. So you need that transition that allows you to keep it in the same state. Um, so now they've gotten that content ready for publication. So the editor comes along and uses transition C to publish it. And then maybe he finds some other things that need to be changed and they can use transition C again to republish it and keep saving it. It's another one where you've got um, from and to the same state. And that le leads me to the last two things I want to talk about with transitions. That you need, you can have multiple froms on each transition, but only one to. And each of those from to pairs needs to be unique. So given that the published transition includes a uh, transition from draft to published, we couldn't create another transition that also covers draft to published. And so here's a, a look at the entire workflow. We're not going to go into any depth there. I just wanted to show that to you before we move on and talk about some, some projects that we've built over the, over the years. So my first full Drupal project was in 2015 when I joined IGES. Um, they had an academic public, well, IGES is a climate change research institute, and they do a lot of um, academic publications to, as the outputs of their research. Um, and they needed their academic publication database migrated from Zoops to Drupal 7. So I learned all about Drupal um, and implemented that academic public publication database. But the part of that project that's relevant to, to this talk is a little bit later on when we needed to migrate that to Drupal 8. They, they liked the Drupal experience, so they wanted the entire IGES website made in Drupal. Um, but they also wanted that academic publication database to begin enforcing a longstanding publication approval policy that the Institute had had, which determines what kind of review, depending on the publication type, what type of reviews that publication needs to go through before it um, becomes public. Um, and workflows became part of Drupal core midway through the Drupal 8 release cycle. So we decided to build that on workflows. It was my first Drupal 8 project, and it was my first time using workflows. So we made a lot of mistakes. I hope those mistakes will benefit you in the lessons learned slide here in a little bit. Um, but that system's still being used, and they're, they're happy with it. Um, the next project I want to talk about is what I just call the mission request system. But that's a travel approval system that we built on an intranet for IGES. Originally built that one in Drupal 7 with rules, and then we ended up migrating that to Drupal 9, um, again using workflows. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about the details of that because that'll allow us to explain in later slides how we implement some of those things. Um, the mission request system allows IGES researchers to go in and make an itinerary, which says which staff are going to be which place on which days, and they also assign budget lines to, to that mission request that says which budgets are going to be used to pay for those, re for those travels. And then in the approval process, we have two approval stages. We have funding approval, where the fund managers of each of those budgets need to approve the use of those funds to pay for that travel. And we have supervisor approval, where each of the IGES staff who are on that mission their supervisor approves them being gone to that place for that purpose. Um, but you may have noticed that I said there's two approval stages, but
but if there's more than one traveler on that, on that mission or there's more than one budget, it's likely that there's more than one approval that's actually taking place inside that funding stage. And so we, that's not something that content moderation offers out of the box. So we need to keep track of that, that state behind the scenes um, and then we can determine when we can actually trigger that transition and change the moderation state. Um, and we'll talk about a little later how we do that. And then fast forward to more recently at Kalamuna, we recently launched for a client the Newcomer Donation Network System that accepts and bets donations for newcomers to Canada, puts them on a marketplace where support agencies can claim them and then find a newcomer who needs them and get those, those donations distributed. We built that one in D10, again on workflows, um, but for this one we used custom entities to power those donations to allow us to kind of have this, a, custom, a common set of fields for donations in general and then use bundles to do the, the more custom parts for each different uh, donation type. So now I'll hand it over to Xiaojun to talk about some lessons. Thank you. So um, the first lesson that we learned is the role of notifications. Uh, notifications are the key elements in ensuring that people understand the actions they need to take and the side effects of those actions. Um, um, then we, when we talk about notifications, I think we mean uh, both uh, off-site not uh, on-screen notifications and off-site notifications, which uh, in our case is uh, emails. So in addition to the on-screen notifications uh, that come out of the box about the changes of state, uh, it is also important to provide um, uh, on-screen notification about what impact uh, their actions have or will have on the request or a submission, or who will be notified or who, who, who has already been notified about uh, the, the action for what reason, and what are the results of um, their actions. So for um, another important element of off-site notification uh, are uh, is that users are not, um, oh, sorry, I, I skipped. Uh, um, in addition to the on-screen notifications, uh, it is important to provide uh, other, other uh, uh, notifications so that uh, uh, people can have a record of the actions they have taken and also uh, those notifications can prompt and uh, the users to take action if the request is not progressing uh, at, uh, you know, promptly. So um, in this particular example, we use emails, as I just mentioned. So when developing the emails, um, we learned an, the importance of separating the email content from the application's uh, logic, uh, from the code, so, um, which makes it easy uh, for us to update the email content down the road. Uh, in, our in our mission request system, uh, we use the message stack of the um, contrib contrib modules to build uh, and manage submission uh, templates within the UI so we can use the token replacement to populate the data. Um, we, re we recommend this kind of a modular approach uh, for making those off-site notifications more uh, manageable. Uh, another uh, aspect to consider is that uh, relying on just one notification may not be sufficient because approvers may be um, busy, too busy, and they might um, overlook the initial uh, notification. To keep things moving, so we should uh, send them a reminder after a certain days of inaction. So again, we can make use of the message stack uh, to build reminders on top of the uh, original ones by adding a blurb uh, as a reminder. Um, the second lesson we learned is about a clear indication of actions. Uh, at every stage of the process. Offering clear status information provides the transparency and also builds trust among users, which is uh, very important for the success of uh, the system. To ensure that people understand the, uh, what's happening within the system, it is important for them to see the status um, of the request at a glance and understand what actions they need to take. So as you can, as you can see on the top right corner, we got two proposals here uh, waiting for action, and they're both awaiting supervisor approval. And then, uh, all the, of course, all the bullet tags are people's names, so we can see whose action is pending and then what state uh, the proposal uh, or the uh, submission is at. 
Um, Bob San uh, mentioned uh, state API just before. So we use the state API to keep track of the information uh, we need to build notifications for each transition. Uh, we can use the information to determine what notifications should be sent to whom when the transition is triggered. The data is also used by our cron job to send the right uh, reminders at the appropriate time. Um, a little bit more about the state API. Uh, Bob, as Bob Chan mentioned, we, uh, the funding approval step uh, of the mission request system require actually multiple uh, approvers uh, to, to approve the, the submission. So this is not something uh, re uh, supported out of the box by Drupal. So we save that data uh, we use this uh, state API to keep track of that data and then uh, determine when a submission has received enough uh, approvals for, for them to move on. So storing data in the uh, associated array inside the state API, uh, with the state API is also uh, good for allow, uh, to avoid uh, repeated calculation uh, when we uh, send a notification. So another really nice thing about the state API is that we can determine the data um, as soon as the, we can delete the data, sorry, as soon as the submission is approved or rejected. As the approval state data is not really relevant to the request as a whole, but it's just uh, relevant to the process itself. So also we don't really need to, to create a separate database table for that, just to host information that is you know, not meant to store uh, for a longer term. Um, so uh, coming back to the slide, uh, another vital aspect for success is to uh, have a system, uh, uh, sorry, to, to implement this audit log, uh, which allows users to track every action uh, taken on a request throughout the life cycle of that uh, request. So you can see an example of an approval log in the middle of the screen, which provides uh, comprehensive data on uh, what actions have been taken and uh, with the timestamp information. So we also find that a timeline view is very useful where, uh, when, uh, in informing users about the status of their submission. So the screenshot at the bottom uh, gives you a clear understanding at a glance of the current state and what is, lies ahead. Um, the third lesson that we learn is about providing appropriate action opportunities. Um, so if you want the system used at all, you, you should make it easy to use. So in our proposal review system, so as soon as you log in, you get a actions dashboard where you are presented uh, with a list of all the actions that you can or you should take. Um, so for example, in the, in the one uh, screenshot on the top right corner, uh, it is this, uh, a dashboard of an accounting reviewer where they are given the opportunity to prepare a project entry based on a submission or review the proposal. So um, notice that the buttons don't change the state of the submission themselves, but they actually take the uh, accountant, accounting reviewer to the content of the, of the submission so they can make a decision based on the content and not just the title only. And also we find that it's really useful to add a checklist of things that uh, we want the action taker to do uh, before finalizing a decision. And this is especially, use, especially useful if uh, the edit form is you know, really long and then we only need uh, them to fill in just a few input in the edit form. So that just gives us the, gives the user a push to make sure that they have the opportunity to uh, ensure nothing is missed before they move on. So with that, I will pass back to Bob, who will take us through more uh, interface uh, considerations. Thank you. I realized I forgot to explain something that set the context for this. So let me just talk, go back to the mission request system really quickly. After we implemented the mission request system, we added a couple more processes onto that internet site. And one of them is a proposal review system, which is the interfaces that we're looking at at the, at the top. Um, that's for researchers who are preparing fundraising approvals, uh, proposals, to get those proposals vetted before they actually submit them to the fundraising agency. And then we ask them to come back and report on the results 
um, and why they think it was successful or not. We put those in a, pro in a proposal database so that future fundraisers can kind of get a head start and maybe be more successful in their fundraising attempts. But if it's an, a successful proposal, that means that I just has funds coming in, there's gonna be a contract. And so those proposals automatically create an entry in our project database, which allows managers at IGES to have kind of a, at a glance, view of all the funded projects that are happening at IGES at any time. But that also comes with its own little workflow. And the important piece of that for this slide is that the accounting team is then asked to go in and review that contract and create the budget lines that are then used to indicate which budgets are gonna be used to pay for which missions in that mission request system that we talked about at the beginning. And during that accounting flow, we use that interface at the bottom, that checklist interface, because they're presented with the entire edit form, and we only want them to edit, to deal with a couple of places. So making it easy for them to find out what they need to do We've got validation on that that just checks whether all the checkboxes are checked or not, and we leave it up to the accounting staff to actually do the work. So yeah, on to the interface. Um, the default content moderation interface caused us a few problems with the publication approval process. And since then, we've we found a solution, the workflows buttons module, that, which has helped us a lot. So I wanna talk through what those issues are and and then why workflow buttons works better for us. Um, and the top right of this slide, you're seeing an interface that content moderation provides by default. And we're looking again at the publication approval process for the publication database at IGES. This publication is in unit leader review. You can see that at the top of the interface that says current state unit leader review. And then it has a change to drop down, which lets you select which state you wanna move to, and then it gives you a save button. Now, the first issue that we run into is a, a lot of our unit leaders are not that web savvy. And some of them just miss that there's a drop down at all. Scroll down, click save, miss the error message that pops up telling them they needed to select something and they think they're done. Now that's a, that's a training issue, but workflow, but workflow button solves that as well. So I thought I'd raise that, but there's actually a deeper issue which requires us to look at the content of that drop down. So again, we're a unit leader, we're trying to perform unit leader review we look at this drop down, and we need to select SMORP review because that's the next state, the state we want to move into. But in my experience with this project, the intuitive choice for a lot of people was to select unit leader review, which saves the publication exactly as it was before without any change whatsoever. And the only way they know that they didn't do the right thing is if an author comes along and says, why haven't you approved my publication? So. Um, with the workflow buttons, that provides an interface like that we see in the two screenshots at the bottom. Um, the dropdown's gone. All the options in the dropdown are now replaced with buttons. But you'll probably notice that the text in those buttons are not exactly the same as the text in the dropdowns. And the reason for that is that we're using transition names for the labels of the workflow buttons instead of the state names. And so if you name your transitions after actions that make sense to your users, gives you an opportunity to provide a really intuitive interface for guiding people to take the action that they actually wanted to take. And I think you'd agree that it's a lot clearer from workflow buttons which one of these is gonna keep it in the current state and which one's gonna move it on to the next state. And then the final piece I wanna talk about on workflow buttons is that probably in a lot of your approvals you don't want your approvers actually looking at the edit form. You want them to be looking at the content in its final state to decide whether it, it's good to go or not. Um, and both content moderation and workflow buttons provides a widget that you can put on the view mode of your, of your entity. But if you're on the view mode, it doesn't really make sense to have an action that saves it into the same state because the only thing that you have an opportunity to change with this interface is the state. So if you're not changing it, you don't need a button. So when we're doing it on the view mode, we always alter that widget to remove that, budget, that button that saves it in the same state. I recently became a co-maintainer of the workflow buttons module, so I'm working on a solution that will do that automatically. But, but for now, on all of um, the ones that we, we build, we just remove that button. There were a couple of other interface issues that we, came, that we came to when building these. The first one was 
on the mission request system again, the first time we built it, we realized if you submit a mission request and it gets rejected, but you get, you get no feedback about why it was rejected, that's not a happy experience. And so we, we wanted to find a way to capture the reason for that rejection without providing the entire edit interface or, or getting in the, the approver's way when they're doing other actions. And so we found that we could use the Ajax dialog box API to put a trigger on the reject button and pop up a modal only when they're rejecting that requires them to put in a reason before they can move on with the rejection. And in this particular case, we don't really care about storing that rejection reason anywhere. We don't need it as part of the request. So we just keep it long enough to include it in the notification that we send to the original user, and then we throw it away. But there was another case where we did want um, to allow reviewers to provide a comment that we would then include as part of that proposal review so we'd have a record of what feedback everyone gave if they gave some. And that's what we see in this screenshot at the bottom. You can see that the unit leader already left a comment, um, but there's a green bar there. If, if the current reviewer clicks on that, it'll pop open and they'll have a text area where they can leave their comment. If they click review complete, their comment will be right below the unit leader comment there. If they don't have a comment to leave, they can just click review complete. It doesn't get in their way and they can, they can um, approve it. This is the last slide we've got on the lessons learned, and this is a lesson that I, I relearn every time I build a project, really. And that's about planning ahead and making sure as much as you can, you've figured out everything that you need to build before you start building. Um, the most painful memory around this is, again, the mission request system. When we first built it um, and we launched it, I presented it to senior management at IGES, and the accounting manager said, this is wonderful. What's going to happen in two weeks when the fiscal year changes and all our budget lines change? <laughs> and what happened was I spent the next two weeks frantically implementing fiscal years on our, on our system. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I'd, I would have liked to do that at a, a more leisurely pace. <laughs> but the, the other thing that um, I consistently forgot to do until this last project um, is to think about that eventually you're going to need to prove the value of your system, or maybe you're going to make a change to the system and you're going to need to prove to yourself that you're moving in the right direction, making things more efficient and not less efficient. And that just means that you need some metrics um, for how your system is working, and it's good to plan ahead about, well, first to figure out what those important metrics are going to be and make sure that you're capturing the data that you'll need to be able to, to get that out. Um, again, on the mission request system, I didn't do that, and then um, we were qu required to prove that um, approvals for, for travel were more efficient than what they did before, and I needed to go and parse those approval logs to find the submitted date and then the rejected or approved date and calculate time to, a, time to decision and then average all of those. And I needed to do that twice a year, and every time I needed to do it, I kicked myself for not making it easier on myself when I built the system. Um, so on the Newcomer Donations Network, this, the screenshot at the bottom is just a prototype of when we were building their dashboard. We've built in capturing timestamps of every transition when we do a transition, so that makes it easy for us to calculate an average time from donation to claim, as you see on the right side. We just talked with the client about what were going to be the important metrics and made sure that we had a way to get those out and that we can provide it to them in a dashboard so that they can get the information they, that they need. So what you sh should you be thinking about when you're planning a system like this? Of course, the biggest piece is going to be the, the workflow. Um, and the first thing in planning that workflow is, of course, going to be what are the stages of this flow? What states can that content be in as it moves through the system? And then once you've got that, then you need to think about the pathways from state to state. I don't think I've ever built a system like this where I got the transitions exactly right the first time, particularly that from and to the same state one is easy to miss. Um, but the best way to get as close as you can to that is to make sure you're thinking about those transitions from every possible angle. I'm in this state, how could I possibly have gotten here? I'm in this state, where can I go from, where can I go from here? Um, is it 
possible that some user is going to need to make changes to the content and keep it in the same state without moving the state. In that case, you need that from to the same state transition. And at that point, once you've got those, that list of transitions, you need to think about who can use them and how do you identify those users. So if you can identify them by their role, then, then you're in luck because that's what content moderation does out of the box. But in my use cases, it's never quite been that easy. Um, and, and sometimes you're, you're going to need to change your system to make sure that you have the data that you need to identify the people that should be able to use the transition. So an example from the mission request system again, funding approval was easy. Um, the budgets are taxonomy terms, each, and the fund managers are users that are referenced on an entity reference field on those taxonomies. So it was easy to identify who are the fund managers for each fund. But supervisor approval, we needed to understand who is the supervisor for each staff at IGES. And to do that, we needed uh, IGES's organizational hierarchy, and that wasn't in our system. So we went and looked at the HR system that IGES used and found that the only data uh, interchange um, capability that had was CSV export. <laughs> so we build an importer, and every time staffing ch at IGES changes, they upload that new CSV, and that data gets updated, and then we can determine who the supervisor is. So it's just important to make sure that you're going to be able to identify those users um, that need to use those buttons. Another thing to think about is how you're going to track multiple approvals per stage if you have that situation like we have on the mission request system. Uh, Shajun mentioned we use the state API for most cases. State API is good. That's what it's for. Um, in Drupal 10, by default, um, all of the state is cached altogether. Um, in Drupal 11, that actually stops being an option, and that's just how it is in Drupal 11. Um, and we recommend state API most of the time, but if you're expecting to have more than about 100 approvals going at the same time, you might be going beyond the bounds of what's cacheable, or if you're expecting to store a whole lot of data within each state, um, state API might not be the right solution. You might want to think about the key value API or maybe creating a custom table to manage that state. Um, but in the systems I've built, we've been able to fit well within that cache uh, for, what, for what we're doing. Um, another thing to think about here is are those actions called the same thing for every user that can use that transition? So an example where it's not on the newcomer donation network um, system that we built, donations come in, the site administrators vet those donations, and if they're okay, they approve them, which moves them into the available state, and they appear in the marketplace where support agencies can claim them. When a support agency claims one, it goes into claimed pending, where again, the site administrators need to validate whether that's a good match, and then they'll either approve it or they'll reject it, which moves it back into the available state. But there's one more way for things to move from claimed pending to available, and that's if the support agency that originally claimed it decides they don't need it anymore. And for those people, it doesn't make sense to push a button that says reject claim. So they need a button that says release claim. So in cases like that, we just alter that workflow buttons um, interface to change the label of that button for those users. Um, it's good to, have a pl to identify those early on so that you know where you're going to have to do those alters. Um, and then this is also a good time to think about if during that transition you want to capture additional details from the approver uh, like we needed to do with the rejection reason uh, in, the, in the mission request system. And then you've got your list of transitions, and those transitions are going to probably be your trigger point for everything else that you do on your system. Um, when you go through one of those transitions, if you're capturing metrics about time from one state to another state, this is where you're going to capture your timestamp. This is where you're going to put your on-screen messages up that say who was notified for what reason and what impact your action had on the system as a whole, those kind of things. This is also where you're triggering your off-site messages. Um, and so you can figure out what those are going to be. And once you have that list of off-site messages, now you've got a list of templates that you need to draft for those, uh, for those notifications. And when you're drafting those templates, it's good to think about with each one, 
is this something that it would be good for me to send out X days later if nothing has happened on this so that we can make sure the approvals don't stall on the system? And those are going to be your reminders. And when you're drafting those, it's good to think about where can I stick a blurb to say this is a reminder because action hasn't happened on this request for X number of days. The other things to think about on the system that are not flow related, we've already talked a lot about statistics, but it's just good to make sure you've talked with all the stakeholders to identify what kind of metrics are going to be important to them. And you also should think about who is going to need to get that and, and why, and what they're going to need it for, what format it should be in. Um, and is it okay for it to be self-serve? Is there some particular format they need it in, and then do they need to be able to filter that by date or by approval type or some other thing? Um, the more planning you, you can do on that, the better it's going to be. Um, it's also a good time to think about how people should communicate about approvals that are in process on your system. Um, for some of these, we use Drupal comments. For other ones, we've just asked people to take it off-site and do it by email or Slack or something. I don't think there's a right answer here. It's going to depend on, on your users, but it's good to think about and have a plan for. And then the final one is I just want to help you avoid having a fiscal year debacle. <laughs> the more legwork you can do up front, the less scrambling you'll do at the end. So yeah, let's just talk about some useful tools. We've already talked about a lot of these. Um, but I want to make sure that we're providing a, a link to where you can find more information on them. Workflow buttons, there's the link to that module. Um, state API documentation there is in that second link. And then I'm sure that most of you are familiar with the form API, but we've got the form API docs and the Ajax dialog boxes um, docu documentation there. Ajax dialog boxes, again, is what we use to pop up that modal where we um, collect more information. Um, communications tools, uh, the message stack has been really useful for us for doing email notifications. Uh, so there's a documentation page about how to use that. Um, and I don't think we talked a lot about how we do our reminder messages, but basically we use the cron hook to schedule checking on that, and then we query state API to, to figure out which uh, requests need a reminder and then we use the QAPI to batch up a list of emails to send. Um, we had the state API link in the previous slide, so here's a link to cronhook and, and the QAPI documentation. And then this final link on this slide is a module called Content Moderation Notifications. It'll do for you what message stack will do if your needs are exactly what content moderation provides out of the box. It allows you to trigger on, on a transition a notification to all to the content author or all users of a specific role. And so if you if you're using those permissions to determine who your your the people that can use your transitions are, then it's likely that content moderation notifications will save you some time. It provides the email templates with the token replacement. Um, and so if your needs line up with that, then you can probably avoid using message stack and save save yourself some time. It's never been the case for me. Um, finally, these, these two tools are usually tools that you would consider to be useful during development, but I found that on a system like this, they can be useful in production. So mail safety allows you to do a combination of four different things um, related to email sending. First thing you can do is stop all email from going out. The second thing you can do is redirect all email to a specific email address or email addresses. Uh, the other thing is you can capture all the email into a dashboard. And then the fourth thing is you can allow email to go out as normal. And so normally, probably in your local development, you're using SendMail to send it through to MailPit or MailHog or something and capturing it so you can see it locally. But then once you get into your pre-production environments on your host, you probably need to reroute your email to, to a specific email address or maybe capture it in a dashboard so you can monitor what's going on without accidentally sending a bunch of email to real people. Well, <laughs> developers are real people. That's not what I meant. <laughs> um, but normally, once you get to production, you would uh, 
either turn off mail safety or you just set it to let emails go out as normal. But if you've got an administrator who needs to kind of keep an eye on what reminders are being sent and maybe resend mails if the approver says they didn't get it, um, you can set mail safety to capture all the email into a dashboard and allow it to send out as normal. And so then you have a trigger where you can resend things. It's an easy way to make that kind of interface. The only problem I have with mail safety right now is that it doesn't work with Symphony Mailer. Um, and so if you're using Symphony Mailer to send out your emails, um, I haven't been able to get mail safety to work with capturing the emails in that way because it doesn't use the mail hook. Um, you're probably mostly familiar with Masquerade, but what a Masquerade allows you to do if you have permissions is assume the identity of another user and masquerade as them and take actions as that user and then switch back to being the user you originally were. Um, what that's useful for in production in an approval system is building a rudimentary delegation system so that you can allow approvals on another user's behalf. But it's a double-edged sword and if you allow users to act as another user and it's not clear that that's what happened, that's a perfect way to erode all trust in your system and make people not want to use your approval system. So this little snippet at the bottom of the slide is showing how you can identify that you're masquerading and how you can get the ID of the original user. And so if you're using that to build a delegation system, you should, you, you could use, you should use this to then update all of your notifications and your approval log entries to say, this user took this action on this other user's behalf. So it's clear to everyone what's happening. Um, and I think we're on to code samples. I've got this, this repo here that's got these code samples in a lot more detail. Um, so we won't spend a lot of time on the code samples here. Um, I'll just quickly walk you through what, what's in there. Um, whoops, skipped one. So first, this is a service that a lot makes it easy to get the transition ID when you're saving a node or an entity. Um, it's really easy to get the from state and the to state. It's a little bit less straightforward to get the transition ID and sometimes that's what you want. So this service makes that easy. I talked about the need for removing and altering the text of the buttons and workflow buttons. It's a pretty simple form alter but that's an example of doing both of those things. This is an example of creating, populating, and sending a message using the message stack. Um, and this is a, an example, a partial example of the modal we popped up to provide to get that rejection reason. The top part is setting the trigger on the reject button to, to trigger that. The bottom is the routing YAML. And then for the controller, it wouldn't fit on a slide, so it's in the, the repo. Let me just run back quickly to that URL in case anybody um, didn't manage to get it. Uh, that's where you can find all of that um, additional detail. And that is all we had. Are there any questions? Yes? So when it comes to Oh, right, right. ECA, I think? ECA, yeah. Yeah, I've, I'm, I've, I'm familiar with ECA. Um, I'm not probably familiar with the other one. I should look into that. I'll ask you a little later what that was called if I, if I run into you again. But the question was, um, have you considered alternatives that allow that parallel approval? We do do parallel approvals um, with this, but I guess that allows also tracking which approvals are done before you move on to the next state. Yeah. Um, 
I, I'm not familiar with the, the last one you talked about, but with ECA, with rules, I, yeah, sorry, what was it? That's nice. Maestro. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I'm not familiar with Maestro. The reason we didn't use ECA is I built the first approval system for my IGES in rules, and I ended up with this big, complex set of rules, relying on components, relying on components, and as I needed to maintain that and make small changes, it ended up being a bit of a nightmare. Um, so I, I didn't want to go through that again. Um, I hear the ECA is a little better. It's, it gives you a diagram. It makes it clear how things move. But I don't think when we built the first uh, publication approval process that that was ready for prime time. And rules definitely wasn't. I don't know what the state of rules is now. But d doing the code in a, in a visual way for me seems like it, it tends to make things a little harder to maintain. Any other? Yes. I guess, so the question was, they built an approval system in, in Drupal 8, and now they have the same approval system in Drupal 10, but the problem is nobody likes it and no one uses the approval system. Should they just throw that away, or should they build a, a new one completely from scratch? I guess, to my mind, that depends on what the problem is, what, what people don't like about it. If it's something that you can easily, if it would be easier to modify what you have to make it more trustworthy for users or easier for the users to use, if that's the problem, then I'd say modify what you have. But if it's a fundamental issue that's going to make it easier, then I guess the only consideration is how difficult it's going to be to migrate what you already have into that new system, assuming that you need to keep track of the, the approvals that have already happened on your system. Anybody else? Yes. Could you say the name of the module again? State Machine. I have heard of State Machine, and I should have researched it when I was preparing the presentation, but I haven't used it. Um, does State Machine is doing workflow stuff, or is it's, okay? It's it's not about capturing state and keeping track of state throughout, or it, I guess it's probably a combination of those things. Okay. He said it's mainly used with the commerce module. Um, so State Machine is another resource to look into. Uh, I'll put that on my homework list too. Thank you. Yes? Where's the approval log stored? So in the, in the, yeah, the question was where is the approval log stored? Um, in the first several that we made, we just created a text field and we just added entries to it each time. On the newcomer donation network system, we started storing it as serialized data um, where we update it and it's more granular, like we have the timestamp as a, another part and what the transition was and we are capturing more data about each stage, which makes it a little bit more challenging to display it to the user, but hopefully it makes it more useful for using for other things. We haven't had that system in, in play long enough for me to know if that was a good choice or not, but it's, it's not too bad to just a pin to your approval log every time and just maintain a, a text area and just make sure that users don't have the ability to edit that and only the workflow system can append text to that. Sorry? Yeah, just a field. Yes?
Okay, the question was clarifying the caching problem with state API. Um, I'm not sure that my understanding is completely correct on this, but I, there was a recent change record in for Drupal 11 that announced that the setting that used to be there to whether state API is cached as a whole, um, that, that option is going away and it's just gonna be cached as a whole in general, which made me aware that state gets captured as a whole and so I looked into more detail on what the limitations there are and the, the change record where that setting was introduced kind of indicated that about 100 entries in that state cache or um, a large amount of data in each state entry might put you beyond the bounds of what you're gonna be able to comfortably cache in Drupal. Um, I, I wish I had a better, more complete answer for that, but that's what I was able to get out of it after I discovered that that might be an issue. Anything else? Yes. When you, when you say managing workflows, what do you mean? Uh, do you do you mean do, are they asking to be able to manage that themselves? Okay. Okay, yeah, um, that hasn't been a request for the systems that I've built yet. Um, so I'm, I'm lucky that I haven't <laughs> dealt with that. <laughs> but I, I, I'd like to talk with you more later and hear about your challenges. Yes? Yeah, maybe I just wanted to uh, add a little bit uh, about this. Um, yeah, um, cause this point that you raised. Actually, uh, I, I think uh, what we can do, um, what we're thinking now is that uh, we use more I think more research is better, as uh, Bob mentioned. Uh, when we do enough research, we might get an understanding of what might be configurable, what might be changeable uh, in the future. So we make those as a configurable item inside the, you know, our own custom module. So that's what uh, I'm trying, planning to, to, do, to do. So yeah, I don't know any, any good uh, yeah, solutions yet, but probably that's uh, maybe one step closer to, you know, to, to what we want to achieve. Thank you.